Thank you for being here. It is my pleasure to speak a few words to those who do not yet know Bikashi, the speaker of this year's Chautari Fund Foundation Lecture. The format of the program is very simple. What I do is introduce him uh, with some words, and then he will present the lecture. And then we'll have one hour, uh, more or less, one hour long open floor discussion. Vikasji attended St. Xavier School, Godavari, and Jalakil, and finished his O level exams in 1975. He was judged the best boy of his graduating class by the school. In 1979, he went to study at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, in Cambridge, from where he obtained a SP in Electrical Engineering in 1983. After working for two years in the Cambridge Boston area, he returned to Nepal in 1985. He worked for development and consulting services in Butuwal for four years before switching to work for the Intermediate Technology Development Group, ITDG, now called Practical Action in Kathmandu. In those 10 years of work, focused mostly on Nepal, he worked intensively in the field of micro hydro development and related appropriate technologies for Nepal. In the early and mid-1990s, along with several other colleagues, as part of the Alliance for Energy, he successfully argued why <coughs> making Arun 3 in the World Bank supported mode with various conditionalities was a big mistake and earned the title of uh, an Arun Birodi from the Nepali press <laughs> and development technocrats. In 1995, he went to the University of California to study in its energy and resource group and obtained a MS in 1997. Thereafter, he worked for Windrock International in its Washington, D.C. office and returned to Nepal in 1998 to work in the Nepal office of, its, of the same organization. He promoted alternative, renewable, and clean energy programs for several years before expanding his scope of work to other parts of South Asia, in particular Pakistan and Afghanistan, and Africa in Kenya and Uganda. He is currently the innovation lead for Clean Energy at Windrock International's Washington DC office. His work experience thus encompasses 25 years in policy review, design and implementation of a real range of clean renewable energy projects in Asia, Africa and Latin America. During the same period, he, was, he has authored several articles and reports in the fields of his work. For instance, he wrote Local Benefits from Hydro Development which was published in the journal uh, Studies in Nepali History and Society, Sinhas, Volume 1, Number 2, in 1996. For several years now, he has been co-writing a textbook on hydropower and is now involved in co-writing an account of the post arun 3 hydropower project trajectories in Nepal, the subject of his talk today. Allow me to digress a little here. In the spring of 1993-94, a young idealist mechanical engineer had just returned to Nepal from India. He had virtually, literally, memorized the book Small is Beautiful, line by line, and was adamant to work at the IDDZ and nowhere else. Luckily, Bhola Shrestaji, an engineer working at the IDDZ, believed the young man and took him in. <laughs> Bhalaji was of course unaware of the difficulties of putting trust on dream smitten adolescents. The meetings regarding Project Arun 3 were also being held in the ITDC office during the period, and the young engineer sometimes stood peripherally 
by the intense discussions among people like people like Deepak Gyawali ji who is here, Rajesh Lali Dahal ji who is here, Gopal Shivakoti ji and Vikas ji. Unexposed to the open discussion culture in his Nepali upbringing, the young man found it extremely exciting that the group amicably set aside issues of passionate dif differences and acted only on consensus. <clears throat> that method worked rather effectively when compared, for instance, to today's chaotic humdrum of political consciousness. It is a bit of a coincidence that the same young engineer, now a bit of a graying historian of technology, is having the privilege of requesting Pikachu for the lecture. Like all great experiments in history, the origins of Martin Chautari are hazy and subject to distinct recollections. At Chautari, we often joke that the organization was founded three times. First, in 1991, when Pikachu, the late Martin Houghton, and several others founded a discussion group called Development Philosophy Development Group, which later became the fortnightly Tuesday discussion series, affectionately also called Mangal Bares by its participants. For most of the next two, three years, these discussions were held in his ITDC <coughs> office in Kamaladi. Martin, who was then a graduate student in Oxford, was tragically killed in an aircraft accident in 1992, and when his parents decided to use the money collected by his friends and family in Norway and Oxford to support the discussion series in Kathmandu, they and Bikasi decided to rent a building in the Thapthari area. That was done in the spring of 1995, and the building where the discussions were now held was called Madhya Chautari, and some people recollect it being called so much before that. MC's second founding, as it were. Finally, when MC, or Chautari, was eventually registered as a separate NGO in November 2002, Bikashi was one of the seven signatory founders. Hence, he has the unique distinction of being there in all three founding moments of Martin Chautari. As Chautari's chair, I am also happy to share that Chautari has been carrying on the same principal legacy of public discussion for the last 23 years. I hope that today's open discussion after the lecture will prove no exception to that tradition. Thanks for bearing me with this room. Allow me now to request <coughs> Vikasi to deliver the 2015 annual Chautari lecture. <coughs> Thank you. Very much. I don't know if I need a mic or if I can be heard in the back. I know this room has good acoustics. Um, let me try without the mic, and if I do need the mic, then uh, I will get to it. So my distinct pleasure to be providing this annual uh, lecture of Chautari. I think uh, Yogeshi has already given the background on. Please use mic. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, already discussed a little bit the intersections between um, Arun III's uh, debate and Martin Sautari. Many of the early, early discussions took place um, in that venue. And uh, in the early days um, of the political changes in Nepal, I think this was one of the, the first issues taken up in this particular way. Um, and I think, uh, you know, really through discussion alone, without street protests, without um, a big, uh, you know, political politicization, I think some sort of a, a movement was launched at that time. Let me go through my presentation. I made a PowerPoint just to keep my thoughts uh, organized. Um, I'll try not to be too dependent on it, but uh, just as an outline. Um, and I'll try and weave the story and the logic behind the arguments around, uh, the debates around Arun Sri, what that meant at that time uh, versus what it means today, uh, what conclusions to reach then versus what happened 20 years uh, in this interim. 
Um, and I'll try and connect those two uh, eventually by the time I get to the presentation. So the background, um, essentially, as I mentioned, is um, you know, Arun Tri one of the was one of the early outcomes, I think, to my mind, of democratic change, where it was finally possible, it was okay to discuss a major topic like this um, and bring it up um, and be hopeful that you know that discussion would lead to the change. Um, now, 1995 August is when the World Bank finally pulled out of Arun III. Um, it's 20 years. This is the, the 20th year. Time has gone quickly, um, and but it does give a very interesting time, um, you know, to look back and take a look at how did the sector develop without Arun III. Many predictions were made at that time about what would happen. Uh, some uh, foretold uh, darkness forever. Others said the alternative would be infinitely brighter. Um, and now we have time, uh, and there's empirical evidence in a certain sense, unusually, because this is uh, uh, hydro, um, there's megawatts, there's dollars invested, there's numbers of projects. So it's much more rich in data than many of the other debates that started at that time. Um, I do want to make a quick disclaimer. Several institutions were uh, mentioned. The Alliance for Energy was a group uh, that was formed, one of the two main groups that was formed around this debate. Um, uh, several members from the original alliance are in this room today. Uh, Martin Chautari, I mentioned, where many of the discussions uh, took place in those early days. Uh, Intermediate Technology Group, where I used to work and where also used to be Martin Chautari's first discussions every Tuesday. Um, Windrock International is where I work today. So the disclaimer basically is I'm not speaking on behalf of any of these groups today. I'm speaking really on my own behalf. But I'm uh, very much indebted to these institutions for having provided that forum at that time. Um, and since I haven't had a chance to check with them on whether they have a, a position on this, I really cannot speak on their behalf today. So the way I will present this, first of all, I think 20 years ago, I expect uh, more than half the people in this room were, uh, you know, had not finished high school at that time. So I think maybe I should give a little bit of a background in terms of what that debate was, since, you know, what may be obvious to some people is not so obvious to others. Um, I will then go through some of the developments in the hydropower sector since then, and make a link with Arun Tree, as I see. Um, what the cause and effect, uh, what happened, what resulted, and perhaps discuss some ways forward based on that understanding. So what was the Arun Tree debate? Um, to make a very clear distinction, something that is confused a lot, uh, the Arun Tree discussion and debate uh, as far as the Alliance for Energy was concerned definitely what was against the way Arun Tree was formulated. And um, it was the main, the main grievance was that the way development worked, the way donor aid worked, that the options had narrowed down to the point where there was nothing else that could be considered. Um, and a single project had been selected through a least cost generation expansion plan, uh, which was considered Nepal's best project, and yet, by the time, since it was the only project running for eight years by that point already, nothing else could even be studied to that same level of detail. Um, and the project particularly had a, a major weakness from our perspective that it was two mega projects back to back essentially. It first required a 120 kilometer road to be built just to get to the project site. And then the dam itself had to be built, the largest dam in Nepal till, till that point. So um, the chances of getting both of these constructed in sequence, in time, within budget, to our mind was um, close to impossible. Um, uh, building a 120 kilometer road in Nepal itself is a major task. This was in the eastern Himalayas that had never had a road before. Um, uh, the 
proposal was made that in order to speed up the road, um, cement and diesel would be helicoptered in at seven different points. So the simple thing that came to our mind was, uh, was Arun 3 so unique that it had to be built under those extreme artificial conditions. One of the big results of this was this so-called best project for Nepal was going to be expensive at close to $5,400 per kilowatt, uh, the 201 megawatt first phase, uh, so-called baby Arun. Um, for close to eight years, no other project could even be considered because the conditionalities of the donors were that uh, NEA should not be distracted with looking at anything else. And as this became the exclusive pursuit, there was no way to check whether something else could be better. So I think, so we call this the no option track. We were going into a narrower and narrower set of um, uh, options for the country, which was looking more and more like this was no way that this was really going to be an asset. Um, and um, we felt, given all the uncertainties of any normal hydro project, the risks were really being stacked one on top of the other to make it completely impractical and um, unnecessary. Um, the other major complaint was that this was crowding out alternative investments. Um, the paths were blocked, both from within NEA and without NEA. Uh, since nothing else could be considered within NEA, uh, no other project could really be looked at. Any other project even studied was considered competition and therefore a distraction. Uh, the private sector was nowhere in sight. That discussion hadn't even started at this point. And not only this, but you will see in the uh, investment plan laid out at that time, after the Arun 3 was going to be upper Arun and then lower Arun. So 80% of future projects were all going to be in a single uh, river valley at one end of the country. So these were all the, the main arguments. This was not an environmental argument. This was not saying that, you know, um, uh, and there were environmental concerns. It's just that this was not the main argument that was made by the Alliance for Energy. What it was not was an argument against Arun 3 as a hydropower project in an absolute sense. Um, Arun 3 came out in many ways as Nepal's best project. And a fundamental argument was if you take Nepal's best project and can only construct it at $5,400 a kilowatt, is there any room for Nepal to still call hydropower a, a major asset for the country? So we felt a, a really good project had been taken, distorted to the point where uh, it really had stopped being an asset already. So it was, uh, I mean, we believe then, believe now that Arun 3 remains one of the most attractive hydropower projects, and that's how it should be developed, in a natural way that it maintains those advantages, not in an artificial way, through a selection process that ended up really providing no other choices at that time. So, what we put forward at that time was what we call an alternative approach. Uh, first of all, the fundamental element of that alternative approach is multiple pathways just as a way to reduce risk. So we wanted both public and private sector companies to be involved and thought that the 1 to 50 megawatt uh, range was a much better uh, place to start. And the the debate essentially at that time, as far as the World Bank was concerned, um, ran in this particular way. That they said, well, you know, Nepal's annual need is only 20 megawatts. But as far as a big funding agency is concerned, it takes as long to develop a 20 megawatt project as a 200 megawatt project. And that typical time frame is 10 years. So there's no point in considering anything less than a 200 megawatt project. Um, so. The, the, the way that argument ran, uh, it resulted in a constant flood and drought syndrome. So you had Kulekhani several years, Marsangdi several years, Arun. It's this artificial way in which the demand would build up, a large project would be built with foreign aid, 
And then again demand would build up, something else would come in. And we felt very much that this was artificial. What really needed to happen was that power should be coming on incrementally. If the yearly demand was 20 megawatts, that could be met with 20 megawatt projects, or two 10 megawatt projects, or 21 megawatt projects. And if they could come on incrementally, and they could come on in different parts of the country, and they could be owned by different uh, owners, we felt this was a much more, um, much less risky way to go forward. We also felt there was lots of idle money in Nepal that should come into hydropower, and that there had been no attempts to mobilize this money at all. Um, and that because we got into this mess because of complete dependence on donors, that this was uh, a respite from that. And also we believe that the public sector investment really should be there to facilitate private sector investments, not to substitute for that. Whenever the public sector is so active that it stops anybody else investing, um, that public sector money really is, can be used in so many other sectors, the social sectors, many other sectors where the private sector cannot invest, schools, health, all of these types of things. And so when a huge public sector investment pushes the private sector out, and then also is not spent in another sector in which the private sector doesn't come, it's a loss loss at so many different uh, levels. <coughs> Uh, fundamentally, we believe that um, hydropower development really needed to be built on a foundation of Nepali developers, Nepali construction companies, uh, Nepali engineering professionals, and Nepali investment. If the price would, was to come down to anything reasonable in the range of $2,000 a kilowatt instead of the 5000 that Arun had got up to. And this was the only way that the aspirations that Nepalis had to get inexpensive, affordable energy could ever be realized. And, you know, if a large project like Arun were to be built, it had to be clear how it wasn't standing in the way of other projects being built. I mean, for us, this was the worst thing, where a single large project stood in the way, was the gorilla in front of the queue, wouldn't let anybody else through, and then became unmanageable, uh, because of bureaucracy and just the way that these things were, uh, were being developed. So the very interesting thing now, and I think uh, I feel so fortunate because so few people get a chance to look back when you have a movement of this kind to say, what really happened? Uh, all these things you guys, you guys predicted, that was all great theory, but what happened in practice? How did this all work out? And, you know, as you might expect, the results are mixed. Uh, it didn't go 100% the way we predicted. In some places, it went slower. Surprisingly, in some areas, it went faster. So let me just uh, sketch out what I believe did happen. Um, so first of all, um, there is debilitating load shedding. And so a lot of people still say, well, if Arun had come, maybe we wouldn't have had this load shedding. And that's an important question that people like, uh, like me have to respond to. Uh, but what that belies, what that is hiding, is that there has been uh, vigorous investment in hydropower within the interim. It didn't all start immediately, but over time that momentum has built up. And I'd like to make a case that although it's hard for people to believe that they're living with 10 hours, 12 hours of load shedding, that load shedding is indeed in sight. Um, and, you know, it's, the momentum is building to the point where um, I believe in, in 18 months after the upper Tamakoshi comes in, we will finally see a major change on that front. So, and this is the evidence. I mean, there are now 42 operating projects at 716 megawatts, but 84 projects with generation licenses of 2,000 megawatts have been given out, and 43 are under construction, and survey licenses, um, 87, some larger projects with up to close to 6,000 megawatts. So, I mean, this is typically in any growing market, what you see happening is you have the stock of existing projects is superseded by the number of ongoing construction, is further superseded by the, you know, it's a pyramid with a lot more projects feeding into that. 
I mean, most countries that have a vigorous growth in their power sector, uh, this is sort of a natural progression. Compare this to what I outlined earlier, where you had the single stick approach, where Marsangi built on top of Kulekhani, built on top of, um, you know, each project one after the other, uh, not with any kind of base below that. And Arun was supposed to sit on, on, on top of that. So many people say, well, why is load shedding not ending? I mean, you have all of this, is, are these projects really being built? From uh, what I can tell, I think in, in uh, 2013, we had about 25 megawatts added to the grid. 2014, it was less. So there's a gap at the moment, I think where about uh, uh, $200 million is being invested every year in hydropower now, which is about the rate at which we need investments to generate 100 megawatts each year. But there's a, a lag between those investments going in and when those actually come out in terms of megawatts. And it's um, in 18 months when that will finally catch up. Otherwise, right now, I mean, if the demand is growing at about 100 megawatts a year, and if the highest addition has been 30 megawatts, clearly people are not going to see a reduction in load shedding. And that's what's been happening. So it really requires one significant large project like Upper Tamakoshi to come in and clearly make a difference for it finally to register. But I'll make my case in terms of where that momentum is coming from. Um, one of the things I also want to show is how the actual um, construction of hydropower projects changed dramatically from what the picture was in 1995. Several slides later, I have a picture of what NEA's investment plan was. This is what actually happened. So if you look at the way projects actually developed, 2014, 13, 12, 11, 9, 10, all the way down, pretty much everything is a, um, a project built with Nepali rupees, the biggest of which was uh, Chilime, and all the other projects, an average of about 7 megawatts. So the portfolio at this point in terms of numbers is clearly dominated by small projects uh, much in the way that I think as the Alliance we had predicted would happen uh, if you open this sector up to local developers. Um, the international private sector did come in, but that ended up being two projects, the Kimti and Bodikoshi, and didn't expand beyond that. NEA's contribution of its own projects has also been relatively uh, modest. You'll see I put Chilime as Nepali private rather than NEA. I mean, it would go somewhere in between, I guess, in terms of... Um, I'm putting this mainly in terms of Nepali private as in the source of money uh, that has come in for, for these investments. So the summary basically is you have, um, you know, in, in, since 2000, NEA, 235 megawatts, four projects. International private, 105, two projects. And the Nepali private, 122 megawatts, 24 numbers. So it's quite clear which way the, the trend in terms of investments has uh, shifted in Nepal. Um, and the remarkable thing is how much Nepali rupees have actually been invested in this sector um, in these years. If you think back to 1995, when the idea that Nepali rupees actually had a role in terms of producing megawatts was uh, in really nobody's mind. This was very clearly NEA's turf. This was a public sector um, territory. And there was really no role for anybody else to be investing. It was the government's money. It was the donor's money. And that's how it would be. So it is quite remarkable that, that 122 megawatts roughly has mobilized about 20 billion rupees. $200 million um, dollars has already been uh, mobilized in this sector. Even more remarkable, one and a half billion is being mobilized for the 1,200 megawatts of projects under construction right now. Not all of this is in hand. Some of it is still being mobilized as these projects uh, go through construction. 
But this is a huge amount of money. And to keep in mind that in these 20 years, one of the big surprises has been that the public, the donor money never really rebounded. I mean, we had thought that, you know, the money that didn't go into our own would be available to other projects. Partly it happened. Some of the money went to Middle Marsangdi. But really, for all intents and purposes, most of the money just didn't materialize. So Nepal has really been the, this, this development where load shedding is in sight has really happened practically all with Nepali rupees. And this would have been almost impossible to predict uh, 20 years ago. It was conjecture. And I'll make an argument for why I think this has happened. Uh, I mean, I'm looking back at the Alliance for Energy Papers. We had predicted at that time that $200 million would be mobilized from the local market. And the World Bank would put in 400 million, and that 600 million would be needed to get us to this point. In reality, that's not what happened at all. 200 million has already been mobilized, but the public sector investment, really, uh, the donor investment, really didn't come through. And uh, there are several reasons for that. So it's very fortunate for Nepal uh, that you know somebody did step into that vacuum. And it ended up being um, the huge liquidity that showed up in the in the market here, um, eventually with its roots in remittances and you know sources of money that took everybody by surprise. So, roughly 20 to 30 billion rupees is has now been coming into this sector now for the last four to five years, and this is the level that is needed to produce 100 megawatts a year. So we are very much at replacement level, pretty much all with Nepali rupees. Uh, but the results are not showing because of that lag, which I think we're about to catch up, as I said, in about 18 months. So this already here, I think, is the good news. Uh, it's a remarkable story. Um, and I think has not been really talked about enough. Uh, and it's just that people, I think, have a hard time visualizing that Load shedding is really that close to coming to an end when they are not seeing it in their everyday lives. And it's because we haven't had that one single project step in and really you know, uh, make this very clear. So who are these investors? Who has been investing in, in the pulse power sector? I make the point in the introductory statement that you know, um, this vigorous hydro development has really been done by uh, non-conventional investors and developers. So take a look at the investors in 1995, take a look at the investors today, and I think none of us were able, would have been able to predict at that time exactly who this would be. Uh, Nepal, Electric uh, Nepal Electricity Authority and subsidiary companies, and there's a remarkable story here that even within NEA, uh, the folks that really believe that Nepalis should, the Nepali engineers within NDA should design and build their own hydro projects, who were um, a discouraged and non-credible group within NDA at that time, when the dominance was by the people, the people close to management were those who went after the more flashy, glamorous, donor-funded projects. That group that had such a low profile really rose in a dramatic way within NDA. Um, the Nepali private sector investors, I will have more details. Some NRN investors, um, um, I think, have also come to the front. Institutional investors, the Employees Provident Fund, remarkably, I mean, this is in the Alliance for Energy papers. Everybody saw this as a big source of money, and that has happened. The Citizen Investment Trust, another pension fund, again, very active. Nepal Telecom, that was a surprise. I don't think anybody saw Nepal Telecom investing in the hydropower sector. Uh, the insurance company, Rashtra Bhima Samstan. Uh, most commercial banks at this point, including the Clean Energy um, uh, Development Bank, which was a dedicated bank to hydro, and you know, um, many commer most commercial banks have invested in hydro at this point. And finally, we're at this point, um, getting also dedicated companies like the uh, public uh, 
company, Hydroelectricity Investment and Development Company, which has come in uh, precisely to, you know, invest in, in, in hydropower. Uh, several companies, some high profile, have gone, gone to the public and uh, raised money through that. Um, and there's some big ones coming up. Um, the folks that have done the most in this area are NEA subsidiary companies. Uh, 20 years ago, nobody in NEA would have believed that they would have the confidence to go to the public and raise money and build hydropower projects. And this has happened. And I'll make the case for why it took pushing Arun off the table for that confidence to come in. Um, um, so Chilime, the Upper Tamakoshi, these are all subsidiary companies of NEA. Um, um, and um, these companies have gone, but several other companies as well, Arun Valley, National Hydropower, Butol Power Company, Sanima, they have all gone to the public. And here there's plenty of room for expansion. I think uh, this hasn't been done in an organized way. I think these are still ad hoc and lots of room to expand this. So who are the developers? So um, if you look at uh, Chilime Hydropower Company was, um, you know, in, in 1995, almost immediately after Arun 3 uh, was canceled, the Chilime project got incorporated and now has three siblings, um, sister companies, and between them, remarkably, these are companies all have majority shares from NEA. Between them, these companies now have, or at least are developing a portfolio, practically as much as what NEA had in 1995, about 250 megawatts. This is a remarkable development within uh, the, the sector. Uh, Woodfall Power Company, which was uh, privatized um, several years ago, uh, is another major company. I think it didn't grow to the extent that people had hoped, uh, or as some of the younger companies grew, but still a, a, a very important player. Um, Sanima Hydropower Limited, this is one of the companies with significant um, NRN uh, non-resident Nepali investment. Um, Hydro Solutions, Arun Valley, several of the people are here in the audience. These are all companies, and I wa what I wanted to point out here is not that these companies have built these very large projects, but the way their ambitions have increased. Several of these companies started with two megawatt projects, three megawatt projects. Um, today they're building 20 megawatt projects. And they have gone ahead and studied projects which are much bigger than what they are likely to be able to construct alone. But they have gone out and feel confident to bring in international partners to work with them to develop these large projects. And to my mind, that's organic growth. That's how it should be, rather than sort of single options uh, of projects without really some credibility of, of uh, you know, to, to support them. So after the cancellation of Arun 3, uh, three fronts opened, two of them almost simultaneously, one a uh, few years later. So the international private sector projects have been, uh, hadn't had their power purchase agreement signed, and all of a sudden, uh, once Arun got pushed off the table, uh, those were signed in a, in a hurry. So Kimti, Bodekoshi, these were signed Chilime uh, became incorporated, as I mentioned, in 1995. That's the uh, company owned 51% by NEA. Uh, it took three more years before the um, minister, Sala Jacharya, uh, issued the standard, asked NEA to issue the standard PPA for projects below 10 megawatts. Uh, in terms of donor resources, KFW invested in middle Marsangdi. The World Bank put forward the Power Development Fund, which really went nowhere. Um, that investment did not move till today. Um, I think USAID and GTZ probably were the only two that provided technical support to, in some ways, support the the uh, the alternatives uh, that the alliance had put forward. The local developers, the small developers. Um, 
And belatedly, we have now investments from KFW, Norwegian, uh, NORAD, ADB, for transmission infrastructure. And the two things surprising to me about the donor resources is, uh, first of all, it didn't go into supporting more hydropower generation as had been expected. But it also didn't go into making the complementary infrastructure investments, like transmission lines, like the larger reservoir types of projects which the private sector would not do. So that just became a gap. And uh, it was uh, remarkably lucky for Nepal that there was enough liquidity in the market that something was able to step in its place. Um, and this didn't end up being, uh, indeed, many decades of uh, darkness. So one of the questions that comes a lot is, OK, so you're showing this picture of a big active uh, sector that came there. Wouldn't it have been wonderful if we could have had both? What if we had all these private sector developers and we had our own? So we wouldn't have load shedding and we would have had a, a vibrant you know, alternative. Why could we not have both? Uh, why one or the other? And I think this is one of these uh, things which is uh, impossible to take both trajectories. So one always, you know, you have to uh, sort of predict what would have happened if we had gone the other way. So I, I'll make some arguments in terms of why I think we couldn't have had both. And, uh, you know, we can discuss during the question and answer session. First of all, let me present to you my Exhibit A, which is NEA's Investment Plan 1994-2007. Think back to the picture I showed of what actually happened in terms of investments, and see if you see any similarity between those two. So, uh, Jim Brook happened, Trishuli upgrade happened, um, Kimti happened, Kalingandaki happened. But after that, the picture is completely different. Right? So what was supposed to happen, based on the 1994-2007, was Arun 3, the baby Arun, which was cancelled in 2000, was supposed to come online in 2002. Uh, second phase of that, 2006. Upper Arun, 2009, and then followed by uh, Lower Arun after that. So this is what the plan was. So it clearly shows the role for international private sector, uh, which was the Kimti and then Bodekoshi got added but really no role for Nepali private um, and public sector companies. None of the Chile may, none of the other small private companies. So it's very clear it was not envisioned. Um, could it still have happened? Could somebody have had, you know, um, uh, the brilliance to see that, you know, the, it made a lot of sense to make the sector more plural? Who knows? But. At that, it, at that time, it certainly wasn't in the books. There was no plan for that to happen. And so it, I have to conclude that it was only because it got interrupted on the other three that a different path was taken, a different result ensued. The second uh, major reason was that uh, there was a very clear narrowing of options as a precondition to doing Arun. So, there were 40 conditionalities which the donor community had put on NEA and the government of Nepal in order to uh, finance a $1 billion project um, you know, uh, in a country that had an annual budget of about $1 billion. So the argument was, this is a major undertaking. Here's all the things you have to do to demonstrate yourselves worthy of um, getting financing for a project like this. And to my mind, the most problematic one was that outside of that investment plan, which was in that MOU, NEA could not even study a hydropower project above 10 megawatts without donor approval. And from the side of the donors, this seemed logical. They said, well, you know, you guys have limited management capacity. We don't want you getting distracted in five different directions. <coughs> But from a risk perspective, this is about the worst thing you can do. Straight jacket somebody and then say you are not allowed to look left, right. Just have to walk this way. And if that falls off a cliff, well, <coughs> so be it. So it's very clear that if you don't study a project, there's no chance of building it. With hydro, there's the typical delay of several years because of the time it takes to study and do EIAs, etc. So 
to my mind, this narrowing of options very clearly meant that if we had taken our route, we couldn't have done anything else. Uh, and narrowing of options uh, is not unique to hydro. We can look again at another sector where the same thing has applied. And it seems to apply particularly to all sectors where only one option is kept open, and generally because of donor requirements. And so this is something that happens in pretty much all poor developing countries, which are highly dependent on donors for any capital intensive project, where the donors require you to do only one thing, uh, professionally designed. And yet, uh, it's oftentimes a very risky step forward. It oftentimes gets countries into big trouble. And this has happened to the Malamchi water supply project in Nepal, uh, which again is another big infrastructure project. The end is not in sight. Several options, all we have stopped looking for those. No other options can really be developed at this particular point. And yet, people are really don't have the choice to, at this point, do anything but wait. It's a sense of helplessness that has pervaded, you know, Kathmandu for now, I, mean, I think, as long as anybody can remember. Because you get to a certain point where only that is allowed, all other options have been stopped early on, and that doesn't go anywhere, what do you do? So. Uh, a very real concern is, could Arun 3 have taken the same path? Where you take on a huge project like this, nothing else can be looked at, no other option can be <clears throat> even investigated, and you have nowhere else to, uh, to go once you're down that path. The other very clear point is that NEA continues to be very unwelcoming of IPPs. There are several developers in this room, everybody can vouch for this. Even without Arun, NEA, every IPP is like pulling teeth. Every PPA is like pulling teeth. Um, you know, uh, and so it's very clear. If NEA itself had Arun 3 coming, had its own project coming, there would be zero incentive for NEA to say, I will sign an IPP with you. I mean, I think most likely they would say, why should I sign an IPP with you when my own power plant is coming five years, six years down the line? Whether that came in five or six years is something completely different. But the fact is, when PPAs are not signed, those projects wouldn't even start. And so it's, uh, if it is so difficult to get PPAs out of NEA without Arun, uh, I am 100% confident that it'd be impossible with Arun. Um, so it's one more reason why I think it'd be impossible to act uh, the, that path. And, <coughs> For me, it's inevitable that given the unstable political climate, the lack of governance, um, the unsettling of everything around, that a project like this could actually be done, as I mentioned, two mega projects back to back. The 120 kilometer road would have to be completed before the dam construction could even start. Uh, the question we asked, the World Bank at that time repeatedly was, there's 6,000 rivers in Nepal, there's hundreds of projects, why are we picking the one project that requires a 120 kilometer road before we can start construction of that dam? Why is it that Arun has to be done today? Why can that not be done later once that road is in place and that risk is much reduced? And the answer each time was this. This is the project that came out of the least cost generation plan. It's the one we have studied. It's the one the donors are behind. Therefore, we do this or nothing else. And it's that particular attitude and that, that straitjacket, I think, which we, um, we avoided. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we, which could have gotten into a quagmire that we would all have uh, not been able to get out of at this time. I'm predicting, given what happened to Madhya Marchandi, what's happening to Malamchi today, that the delays and cost overruns on Arun would be increased by a factor of five. First of all, this project would have been three times as big as Madhya Marchandi. And second of all, it wasn't close to a road like Madhya Marchandi was. So straightforward projects in accessible areas were delayed at cost overruns. Arun, which had all these things multiplied, you know, um, 
I cannot imagine how this would be, uh, you know, miraculously on time and, and within, within budget. So my conclusion is, uh, I have two simple conclusions. One is that Nepal is in a much better position for construction of Arun 3 today than 20 years ago. Um, as I mentioned, the argument has never been that Arun 3 should never be constructed. Why do I say this? Well, the fundamental one, what I've been saying for the last 45 minutes is, you don't want to get into the position of having only one option. And today, because of all the other developments that have happened, Arun is one of many projects. Um, it, it has, the risks surrounding any project are not going to be reduced <coughs> over time, but that risk is going to be mitigated by the fact that there are several avenues that are happening. Secondly, even that money is not really being looked at from public resources, and so it doesn't block anything else. It's somebody else's risk. That risk gets divided between different institutions. The road is largely completed. There was a very strong argument at that time to say that the poor people in the Arun Valley would have at least gotten a road if that Arun 3 project had gone through. Why did you guys stop that? And the argument I want to make right now is, in these 20 years, all, a huge number of districts now have a road. Mustang has a road. Uh, you know, you've got road uh, going to Jumla. You've got roads pretty much everywhere at this point. So it's a natural progress where every district, every all the remote districts, remaining districts needed roads. So now that the road is there, I mean, it's a much more natural way to get to our own tree. And uh, that's uh, huge. Here's maybe perhaps the most dramatic evidence. The cost of the new developer is now a billion dollars, but now for a four and a half times bigger project. What was a billion dollars for a 201 megawatt project is now a billion dollars for a 900 megawatt project. And so indeed, Arun remains fundamentally a sound project if done the right way, but if done in a way which is artificial, pushed by a planning, faulty planning process, we could have been saddled with taking one of our best projects and turning it into something four times more expensive than it needed to. Um, local people are much aware of their rights and their uh, their share of the benefits, their rightful share of benefits. So I think, you know, this is the other issue. I mean, there's been so much discussion in these 20 years about how what share of the royalty or shares of, of the company local people should get. Um, it's not just a question of mitigation. I mean, I think we've gone one step further, and I think this is another benefit uh, which uh, is likely to come uh, from the project in terms of local areas. So this is one set of um, conclusions. The second conclusion is that the alternative approach, to my mind, is well on its way to being realized. It's a much more pluralistic sector than we had in 1995. Um, and um, there isn't, there didn't happen the complementary public sector investments in time, although those are belatedly catching up. Um, and by the complementary public sector investment, I mean, if the private sector is doing all these run of river projects, in a rational planning system, the public sector should really do the reservoirs and the multipurpose projects, which the private cannot do. The public sector should do the transmission lines, and those didn't happen. So the alternative was not really supported in a planned way by anybody. It uh, just has happened. Uh, several one-offs all combined to form a, a sector. Uh, donor funding was slow uh, to, to support the alternative <coughs> sector, but remarkably remittance kicked in and surprised everybody and saved the day for not just the hydro sector, but the country as a whole. Um, despite the conflict, despite everything, I think everybody recognizes that it's the remittance that's keeping the country afloat. And uh, so this is where we are today. Thank you.